Welcome everyone. In today's lecture, we are going to look at the analysis of structures using failure criteria. In the last two or three lectures, we have learned about failure criteria for brittle materials and ductile materials. So in this particular class, we will look at the failure criteria for ductile materials, essentially the Tresca and von Mises criteria and how you apply them for actual analysis of structures. Okay. So by the end of this lecture, what you should be able to do is distinguish the different types of problems that involve the analysis of structures using failure criteria. And specifically, you will be able to analyze circular shafts that are subjected to combined loading using Tresca and von Mises criteria. So that will be the point of this lecture. Okay. So before we go into the specifics, let's look at you know, you know, the broader picture. Okay. So if you look at the analysis of structures using failure criteria, the problems that you encounter essentially will fall under three categories. Okay. The first is what is called as a material selection problem. The second is what is called as a verification problem. And the third is what is called as a design problem. So what is a material selection problem? So this is a problem where the dimensions of the structure, for example, the diameter and length of a shaft are given to you and the loading conditions. So the loads might be just forces or there could be a combination of forces and bending moments and torsional moments and so on. Essentially the loading conditions that the material is subjected to, those are also given to you. And you essentially have to choose an appropriate material so that the structure does not fail. So for example, you might be having an option of choosing a shaft that could be made of aluminum or steel or titanium or nickel, for example, right? For the given loads and the given dimensions, steel might do the job, but aluminum might not. So essentially you have to choose what material this structure has to be made out of so that it doesn't fail. So that is the first category of problems, okay? The second category of problems is what is called as a verification problem. So in this case, the material properties are given. So essentially you are told that, okay, you have to use this particular steel to construct the shaft, okay? And you're also given what the dimensions of the shaft are, okay? What is its length, what is the diameter, and so on, okay? What you have to do is determine what is the maximum loads that you can apply, okay? Or in the other case, if you know what the loads are, you have to figure out whether this particular shaft will be able to bear those, bear those loads, whether it will either survive or it will fail. Okay, that is what is called as a verification problem. The third type of problem is what is called as a design problem. Okay, in this case, you are given what material you can choose and you are given what loads are going to be applied. Okay, now you have to design the structure. So for example, you might be asked to determine the diameter of a shaft okay, that has to be provided so that that particular shaft avoids failure. So essentially, any problem that involves analysis of structure using failure criteria essentially falls under one of these categories. Okay? So we will look at specific examples in the class where we look at either a material selection problem or a verification problem or a design problem. And you'll also do more problems in your homeworks that will touch upon all these different types of problems. Okay. Now, <clears throat> let's, talk at, let's look at the structure that we analyze the most in this class, which is essentially circular shafts that are subject to combined loading. Okay. So if you consider a slender circular shaft, so what I mean by slender is that the length of the shaft is at least 10 times larger than the diameter of the shaft. Okay. And let's say the shaft, or it could be, for example, a beam that has you know, similar dimensions that is subjected to combined bending, axial, and torsional deformation. Then that particular beam or shaft is essentially going to experience two types of stresses. Okay. A normal stress, sigma, that occurs due to the bending and axial deformation, and a shear stress, tau, that occurs due to the torsional deformation. Okay. I just want to remind you that in this class, we ignore the effect of the internal shear. We only look at the shear stresses due to torsion, not to internal shear stresses, or, or not to internal shear forces. Okay. So let's think of a simple case or a simple beam like this that has a circular cross section. Okay. 
And then let's say it is subjected to a bending moment, MR. Let me just erase that. Okay. And it's subjected to some torque, T. Okay. And let's say that this is the axis of the shaft. Okay. If you look at the cross section, this bending moment MR could be in some arbitrary direction. Okay, so this is your y axis, and that is your z axis, and the x axis is coming out of the plane. Okay, so that is the direction of MR. It could be in any direction, and you also have a torque that is acting on this plane. Okay, so if you have something like this, of course, you can also have an actual uh, force acting on this particular cross section. But whatever would be the case, essentially you are going to have two types of stresses. There is going to be a sigma x, okay, which is a normal stress that occurs due to MR. And any actual force or actual force is probably the right way to put it. Okay. And of course you are going to have a shear stress due to the torque. Okay. So effectively, you are going to have two types of stresses. Okay. Now, if you have such a stress state in the cross section where you have a normal stress and the shear stress, essentially you can write the sigma matrix at any point in the cross section as this. A sigma, a tau, and all the other stresses are zero. Okay, so essentially this is a 2D stress state. Okay? So it's what is called as a plane stress condition that we learned probably a few lectures back. And that is how, and this is how the stress matrix looks like. So this shear stress that I have written here is nothing but Tc over J. And the sigma is nothing but Mr C over I. plus or minus n over a, okay? MR, of course, is the resultant bending moment. C is the radius of the shaft. J, of course, is the polar moment of inertia. I is the area moment of inertia, which is basically half of J for the circular cross-section. N, of course, is the normal force acting on the cross section, and A is the area of the cross section. Okay, so essentially the sigma is MRC over I plus or minus N over A, and tau is TC over J. Okay, the reason that you have plus or minus N over A is because the normal force can either be a compressive normal force or a tensile normal force. Okay, so the the value of sigma can change depending on the sign of N. Okay, but essentially you have only two types of stresses. Okay? Now let's consider a simpler case. Okay? Here I am going to look at a solid circular shaft. Okay? I'm telling that it's a solid circular shaft, it's not a hollow circular shaft. Okay? And it is subjected only to bending and torsion. Okay? So it is not subjected to any actual deformation. I'm just doing this because this is a simpler case and you can come up with a formula that is actually very uh, concise. Okay, so in this case, let's again assume that MR is the resultant bending moment at a particular cross section, and T is the internal torque at that cross section. Okay, then at the critical point in the cross section, so what I mean by that is that, so you have the cross section, okay, and you're going to have an MR. Okay, we know that the points where the bending stress is maximum, okay, is either going to be this and that, okay? This is going to be a compressive bending stress and this is going to be a tensile bending stress, okay? Those two points essentially are the critical points, okay, where the bending stress is maximum. The shear stress is maximum across the entire circumference or along the entire circumference. So these points here and here are also going to have the maximum shear stress, okay? But for those two points, 
you have sigma bending is mrc over i. So then you substitute the formula for i, which in the case of a solid circular cross-section is pi over 4 times c to the 4. Then you end up with either this formula or that formula, depending on whether you are using the uh, radius c or the diameter d to define the bending stress. Okay. Now, you can also find out what is the shear stress due to the internal torque, and that can either be written this way or that way. Okay, It's essentially the same formula. In one case, you have the radius. In the other case, you have the diameter. Okay. Now, we know what sigma bending is, what sigma is, what tau is. Right? So essentially, the sigma matrix at the most stressed point in the cross-section is going to look like this. Okay. Again, it's only two stresses the sigma due to bending, and the tau due to the torque. All the other stresses are zero. Okay? And one thing I want to note is that this sigma okay, is the normal stress along the axis. Okay? Along the axis of the shaft or the beam. This is something that I really want to emphasize, that when you have bending, there is only one normal stress and that normal stress is always along the axis of the shaft or the beam. Okay? So as I mentioned earlier, this is also a 2D stress state. Now, when you have a 2D stress state, you can find out what tau max is. Okay? And tau max is going to be given by this formula. Okay? Again, this is something that we learned in 2D stress transformations. Okay? So if you think about this formula here, it looks a little bit of a confusion because we have always learned that the maximum shear stress is Tc over J. Now I'm telling you that the maximum shear stress is not Tc over J, it is something different. So what is different here? So when you talk about Tc over J, that is the maximum shear stress in the cross-section. Okay? This maximum shear stress is the maximum shear stress in any plane. Okay, there's a big difference there. Okay, so if you think about this cross section, the shear stress in that cross section is going to be Tc over J. But that is on the plane of the cross section. But this tau max doesn't have to occur on that particular plane. It can occur in some different plane. And the maximum shear stress on any plane at those points of maximum compression and tension, that is actually given by the formula there. Okay? So that is the formula for finding out the maximum shear stress. And it's only if this tau max is less than Sy over 2, then the material will not yield based on the Prescott criteria. Okay? So now in this case, sigma x is 16 mR over pi d cube or 32 mR over pi d cube. That is what we learned here. Sigma y is 0. Okay, because only the, the normal stress along the axis is non-zero. Sigma y is zero. In fact, sigma z is also zero. Okay? So in that particular case, tau max has this expression. Okay? So in that particular case, then you can substitute the formula for sigma and tau, and you end up with a very, very compact formula. Okay? Tau max is 16 over pi d cubed times square root of mr square plus t square. Okay. If you look at this formula, it is actually very similar to tau is Tc over J. Okay, because that we just found out is nothing but this, right? Which is 16t over pi d cube. Okay? So this formula here and that formula there are actually quite similar. Except that instead of having just the torque, you have a function that depends on both on the torque and MR. Okay, so I said sometimes we call this uh, expression square root of MR square plus T square as an effective torque or T effective. Okay, again, I want to emphasize that this formula turns out is correct only for solid circular shafts. If you have a hollow circular shaft, the I and J are going to be a little bit different and the formula is not so compact. Okay. But at least for the case of solid circular shaft, essentially you can write this tau max as 16 over pi d cube times some effective torque. Okay? 
And of course, if you use the Tresor criteria, this tau max has to be less than SY over 2. Okay, that is the criteria for a material not to yield based on Tresor criteria. So effectively, what we are doing is that we are looking at the two points in the cross section where the bending stress is maximum. Those points also turn out to be the points where the shear stress in the plane is maximum. Then in that those two points, we essentially find out what is tau max, okay? And this tau max occurs at those two points, but not in a plane that is the cross-section of the plane. It is occurring on a plane that is oblique to the cross-section, okay? And then we use that particular expression for tau max and make sure that that is less than or SI over two. And if that condition is satisfied, the shaft is not going to yield, okay? Now, you can say that it is not just that I don't want it to yield, I want it to have a factor of safety, okay? So if you say that you need to have a factor of safety n, then this tau max should be less than Sy over 2n, not just Sy over 2, okay? That is how you analyze solid circular shafts subjected to just bending and torsion using the Tresca criteria, okay? You can use the same kind of analysis for looking at the von Mises criteria, okay? So, if you want to use the von Mises criteria, essentially, you are again going to look at the same two points. So essentially, if you look at the cross-section, you're going to have this MR in some arbitrary direction. You're going to have these two points where you're going to have the maximum bending stress. Those are still going to be the critical points, okay? But now, instead of evaluating tau max at those two points, you have to find out what sigma von Mises is and make sure that that sigma von Mises is less than SY, okay? and make, for you to mention, make sure that that particular shaft does not yield. Again, in this case, if you want to have a factor of safety n, then the sigma von Mises should be less than or equal to Sy over n. Okay. Now here, I want to kind of point out one thing. When we learned about von Mises criteria, we essentially used this formula. Sigma von Mises is square root of one over half times whatever the expression is. Okay. This expression, if you recall, depends on the principal stresses, okay? So you can always find the principal stress at a point and then calculate von Mises. But there's also another way to calculate the von Mises stress, and that is using this expression, okay? So in this case, if you know sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z, and tau x, y, uh, tau y, z, and so on, essentially, then you can also evaluate what von Mises uh, stress is and use that to find out what is the factor of safety or whether a material will yield or not. Okay. And another thing that I want uh, to emphasize is that if you look at this expression here, you have three shear stress terms, okay? Now, if you look at a cross section, okay, let me just think of this as my x-axis, which is going out of plane. Y-axis is going up and z-axis is going to the left, okay? Now, at a point like this, the shear stress is going to look like that, if the torque is like that, okay? That is going to be your tau x z, okay? If you go to a point like this, the shear stress is going to be like that, which is going to be a tau x y. But if you look at a point somewhere in between, here, then the shear stress is going to have two components, both a tau xy component and a tau xz component, okay? So how do you find out what is tau xy and tau xz? Actually, you don't need to find out what they are individually because the shear stress that you calculate, T is equal to Tc over J, is actually Let me just erase this. It's actually tau x y square plus tau x z square to the power half. Okay, so essentially, you already know what tau x y square plus tau x z square is. Tau y, tau y z square is of course zero. Okay, so essentially, this von Mises criteria is the second term here is essentially in this case just six tau square.
okay, where tau is T C over J. So you don't have to individually know the components because what you're interested in is in the sum of the squares, which is fortunately just tau square. Okay. So essentially the idea is the same. You find out what sigma x is. That could occur due to bending or actual deformation. In this case, it's just bending. And then you find out what tau is, which is just due to the torque. Then essentially your sigma one mesis for the 2D stress is going to be square root of half times two sigma x square plus six tau square. Okay, so essentially there's only one normal stress and there is only one shear stress effectively, which is nothing but Tc over J. Okay, so that is how you analyze a solid circular shaft using both one mesis criteria and uh, Tresca criteria. In an example that we will be doing in the next lecture, I will look at a hollow circular shaft and how essentially we can use the same ideas to evaluate the factor of safety using the one mesis criteria and Tresca criteria. Okay, With that, I will end the lecture and I will see you in the next class. Thank you.